what's your advice for, for people starting out or for other groups? What are the, the lessons you've learned, um, the best tips or the best solutions or the best answers to questions you've come up with? The good oil, I guess. The, if um, somebody's asking for advice, what would be some of the key things you'd tell them about uh, having a catchment group, getting it up and running, operating successfully? So, look, I haven't got a, I can pick on somebody if you want, but who wants to put their hand up and answer first? And Anna's off the first cab off the rank. So, Anna, tell us your uh, best bit of advice or your key lessons learned. My, my, my one best bit of advice, King Country River Care would say, would be pull your resources and pay something, pay someone to do some work for you and do it do it earlier than later. So we've had a few questions on, on funding, Anna, so I'm going to actually explain. When you say pulling your resources, how do you guys fund your group? So we, as I, as I said before, there was about 15 farmers initially that, that put in money to get that initial uh, coordinator or person on, on, on the payroll, and that expanded out to around 50 members. And yeah, that was it was a reasonably expensive sub, I think probably, but they just saw value in it. And the having a paid person meant that action happened. And I just think it's very easy for us farmers who are super busy to talk about it and to have the really good intentions, but it's just quite challenging to make stuff happen. So that yeah, it's just I think you've got to pay someone and get them get them enabled to get going. And do you do that as a, a flat fee, Anna, or a, a, a levy per hectare? How does that work? So our initial our initial fee was set at two hundred per hectare plus fifty cents a hectare, capped at seven hundred and fifty dollars. So it was uh, yeah, like I say, it was not a um, not it was a significant investment for some, but that's where we started it, and um, it's due to be reviewed, and it won't have to stay at that level because because I've managed to find some funding, so we won't be continuing like that, but that is where we started. Awesome. Rick, is that you waving at the screen? You want to tell us some, some key lessons learned or bits of advice? Yeah, just like Anna, you know, um, for, for um, a catchment group to have longevity, you've got to have structure, you've got to have people with expertise to facilitate um, uh, what's going on. And um, so then you can really bed down a, a, a step through or plan of attack and um, one, of, one of the key things and I mentioned earlier was to actually do that environmental forensic work because farmers will always ask what's the problem and if you can you can um, present them with data then they understand why they have to do some stuff and there may be some um, biological like our focus is a, is a priority question might be something else I know um, over your way Anna I, um, Danny Dark's talking about freshwater mussels, you know, and um, and their rohi. So, you know, give farmers an understanding of what's going on, and and there's nothing more powerful than getting farmers or leading farmers um, down to a stream and getting them to understand invertebrate and fish health. That really turns on the lights for them, and then they take that back and get an understanding of what they need to do through their uh, farm environmental plans. So, um, just having Good advice um, and, and stepping through a series of things to empower the community is really important because if you go off half cocked, you'll lose interest. Um, so, you know, the group like this is really good because we can bring ideas to the table and share them with other groups who are wanting to start up. And, and this is really good, Aaron, because um, we have made mistakes. And uh, so, but we've, we've had some real good successes too. Brilliant. Thanks, Rick. And Rick mentioned the word community in there. I'm just having a quick look at the poll results. I'm, look, I'm not 100% familiar whether you can all see them, but obviously protecting the environment for future generations is right up there, 97%. But lo and behold, uh, engaging with communities, the, the second highest, 91% of responses. So, um, and I think Rick and all the other speakers have touched on, that's a, a key purpose of these groups. Now, uh, Roger and then Peter, I think, are the, the next two I've got. Aaron, so, can I just... Oh, it's Rick, go away. Sorry, just a quick mention, you know, we're really lucky. We've got some really key people, people that work for ag research and that sort of thing in our community. But there's, if you haven't got those sort of people, there's heaps of people not far away, might be in a town nearby that have retired, that want to get away from mum's, um, uh, out from mum's dress or whatever, under mum's dress, and, and, and get out in the communities and work with people. There's heaps of people that will uh, got a skill set that you need that you can tap into. Yeah. 
Thank you, Rick. Roger. Right. Thanks, Aaron. Um, yeah, starting a group, uh, really important as far as I'm concerned. Um, for start, it's got to be driven by farmers. Um, I'm, I don't agree that we need to employ someone straight away. It's got to be pushed by farmers. Um, the employment comes later on to support once you've got that initiative going. So number one, it's got to be driven by farmers and not consultants, not beef and lamb, not Dairy NZ, anyone like that. It must be driven by farmers within a community. Um, very, very important from our point of view. Um, the other thing is, um, don't set grandiose goals. Don't think you're going to achieve the world overnight, because if you do, you just chase farmers away. If you think you're going to fix the freshwater policy and the erosion and everything else and hit the, hit the national standards, you, you won't get anyone joining you. Okay, so it is very, very small steps. It is, first thing is to get farmers on board, and it's everyone on board. If you set fantastic plans for everyone to aspire to, people will hide under the rock. It's as simple as that. Um, like I, when we set up our one, the first one, first thing that one of our groups wanted to do was not have any rubbish on the farm. But that didn't matter. That was all that group wanted to do. That was their first plan, is not have any rubbish on any farm. That was their first step. The next step, it might be improve their, um, their grazing management. But if you, we must start small and we must include everyone. Uh, the other thing is a community catchment group, a sub catchment group must be formed around a community. Okay, people have to know everyone. You can't have it that it's stretched over 50 Ks because people don't know everyone and people will hide under a rock. So they must be based around schools, um, a community or a river, be a river catchment. But, and there is no size fits all. Some, are, some, uh, some can only have five people in, some may have 15 people and there's no rule. But it must be around that people want, that people can connect and they can't hide under a rock. Um, the last thing I've got is when you're setting up, there is heaps of support. Beef and lamb, fantastic support. New Zealand Landcare Trust, fantastic support. And we got Horizons in with us. Um, we got, uh, I tell you what, there is no shortage of support to get this thing going. Um, and, uh, but it must be farmer driven uh, and it must be uh, getting everyone on board. That's me. Brilliant. Thanks, Roger. Look, as I, I touched on everybody that's listening, A, that we're going to make the recording of this available so you can listen to these words of wisdom again. Uh, B, we'll flick out an email with links to some of the resources that are out there. But I also just, given he's just finished speaking, I would give a bit of a plug. We've got a video and a podcast with Roger talking about his particular experience in some depth. I think an hour and five minutes or an hour and ten minutes wasn't Roger that went for that discussion. So um, if you want some more of the good oil in depth, then uh, that's available as well. And we'll put the links to that in the email. Peter, are you still wanting to, to join, uh, have your say? Brilliant. Yeah, look, look I, just, I just totally agree with what um, Anna, Rick and Rogers have said. Um, totally agree that it must be farmer driven. Um, and look, we've got a funding model that's, and I see there was a wee question there before about who funds us. Well, we're funded by, uh, we don't have a farmer subscription. We have um, funding from um, our district council, our regional council, and our irrigation company. And that's enabled us to employ uh, 20 hours of a coordinator. We've actually got two coordinators now. One's an ex-retired uh, uh, um, consultant, and another one is a, a farmer's wife who's ex-school teacher. And we have, um, so we've got a, a strategy, and as Roger said, you don't want to start off too big and think you're going to change the world. We probably thought that, that we we're going to fix up everything in, in a year. And uh, here we are six years later, uh, baby steps. That's, that's quite, quite important. You need to define your purpose and that takes a wee bit of time to perhaps get your mission statement or your goal or whatever, or your, your reason for existing really defined. So that when people ask you, who are you, what are you, you can tell them. Um, but it does take a long time. We've got a bit of a, a, we've often used a statement that we've been flying the aeroplane at the same time as we've been building it. And it's been quite frustrating at times um, where sometimes you can have a meeting, you go to the meeting, uh, you know, a strategy meeting, trying to, the committee's trying to work out things, what we're going to do while we're existing. And you're going, oh, I'm just sick of this. I just don't want to be here. You get every, you get your whole team together and you, and then all of a sudden you're going, wow, this is really cool. Uh, we're actually achieving things. And we've done a whole lot of, uh, lot of different projects around our district. And 
that's based on our four pillars of our strategy around connectivity with wider stakeholders, um, on-farm change, and science and monitoring, and future-proofing, which is around the funding side of things. Um, so that's, um, yeah, that's where we, uh, how we operate, um, and um, they're the key, key sort of things. You've got to have an open mind, uh, got to work on science and fact. Um, yeah, and I think the other thing is that we need to be careful of this day and age is not to get drawn into um, the emotional keyboard warriors on Facebook sort of thing. We, we need to work with those science and facts um, so that we are making genuine improvements um, on environmental issues. Thanks, Peter. Now, Josh, I can't see you, so I'm not sure if you've been waving at me frantically, but um, anything you'd want to add in terms of, um, yeah, from your experience with that group, any advice for other groups? Just on the funding side, um, I think one of the big advantages of farmers putting in some sort of uh, contribution is that um, it's unencumbered which means that you can leverage it to access other funding. You know, that's been one of the um, big benefits of our funding is that our members put in a $200 annual membership fee. And from that, you can multiply that four, five, 10 times over, depending on where you're looking um, at funding. Uh, so definitely having something like that in place is, um, is beneficial. Brilliant. Now, Richard Parks, I'm not sure whether you were scratching your nose or were you waving at me like a... You don't have anything you want to say? Uh, That's right. No, I okay. Think, I think Mark's got something there. Right. I didn't know. Yeah, it was like an auction, Richard. You made a move and I saw it out of the corner of my eye. So I thought, right, I'll go to him. Okay, back. Mark Adams. Yeah, th thanks, Aaron. Um, I think um, one of the things that became um, obvious to me early on in, in, in our process was that um, when you set up a community catchment group, you you, you embark on an educational journey and and you don't have to know everything um, in fact it's it's better to to start that journey with an open mind rather than preconceived ideas and that includes your facilitator um, the facilitator doesn't have to know everything either you you, you all come up to speed together um, I think that um, one of the first things that you, that you realize early on in that journey is that you don't have enough information, you don't have enough data. And so you embark on this massive data gathering exercise. And, and so it's to have a, a, an honest um, approach to that data and then some honest conversations around what that data uh, tells us and then being prepared to have some hard conversations around that. Um, and, I, and I, yeah, it, it's just sometimes it's unpleasant when you find yourself on the wrong side of the numbers. Um, one of the um, other things that, that, that stood out to me is that um, if you work and are patient with people who are belligerent, uh, you can turn them into champions. Um, and I know of, I'm thinking of a couple of folk that, that um, would, would early on in our meetings would be quite vocal around why we're we here, what's this all about. And, um, and as they began to connect to what it was we were trying to do, um, became very vo vocal advocates of, of what we were doing. So I, don't, I just don't write people off. Um, and just there's, there's a dignity that needs to be involved in this process and in these conversations and just and, and, and are working with people. But lastly, I, I just, and I'd like to just um, respectfully disagree with Pete and, and a comment he made. Um, I think that it's really important uh, that as farmers that we recognise that um, largely the environmental conversation is an emotional one and, and that um, a lot of people within our communities are emotionally connected to the land, the soil, uh, the water, and, but don't know how to articulate that, um, may, may not be so, so able to really express what it is they're feeling and often it comes across as anger and frustration and and, and, and we, we feel the brunt of that. But um, I think, you know, we, we need to acknowledge that emotion and also the fact that as farmers, we're emotionally compromised as well. And, and that's often reflected in our response when we're challenged in our farming systems and, and, and the way that we engage. So it, yes, it needs to be um, science-based, 
uh, community led and but uh, emotionally mature. Thank you. Thanks, Mark.